Hey everyone, hope you're doing well out there. Thank you for joining me on this journey, where I will be talking to people from all walks of life about their unique wisdom, experience, and philosophy. My very first guest will be artist, producer, and beatmaker, Simile. He's worked with such artists as Alan Weiss, Just Bars, and S.B. Austin. We sat down to discuss sampling, stoicism, and of course, anime. As always, thank you for being here. So, Simile, you are a producer, artist, beat maker, curator of sounds, and compiler of experiences, and one of the kindest people I've ever met. Your new record, Terms and Conditions, is out everywhere music is sold. Simile, thank you for being here today. <laughs> thank you, dude. That was a great intro. I appreciate that. Man, greatly uh, appreciate you inviting me, man. Um, and yeah, terms and conditions, dude. Yeah, dude. <laughs> so uh, before we begin, I wanted to just share that we've only uh, known each other for about, or known of each other, I feel like, for about six months or so. And we've only come to meet each other a handful of times, like maybe like five times. And um, Definitely. I've just felt uh, within those handful of times that we've met each other, we've had like a kindred spirit of sorts. Um, I've just been like drawn to your energy, you know, and, uh, I, I really appreciate you always bringing that good, positive energy wherever you go. And I, I know that is, you know, that, that's not always easy, you know, people think it may become easy, but I, I appreciate you doing that for, to everybody you meet, you know. Thank you. Man. Yeah. Some, some <laughs> things seem to fall perfectly into place and, uh, I, I just, uh, I'm blessed to have met you, man. Man. Kind words. Thank you so much. And it is true. It's crazy how it's not been too long, but the it feels much longer. And every time we have met, it feels like time stops. And mm -hmm. each conversation is so monumental. And I just, I really feel like I've grown to find a great friend within you as well. You're super cool, dude. You're just like a cool cat. <laughs> I really appreciate that, man. Definitely, Thank you. Dude. <laughs> So uh, let's talk uh, first about uh, Terms and Conditions. It came out uh, in February, and um, I was just wondering, at first initially, what headspace were you in when you were creating that record? Man, so a lot of... First of all, great question. Um, and it did just come out just a month ago. I feel like Terms and Conditions started several months ago and so really I was finding a way to take a lot of the sounds that I already had and it usually is some of the leftovers and some of it's like purposeful like for the album mm -hmm. and it always comes down to when I have time to have the creative passion for it and that allows me to figure out like okay even though I may make music like almost every day, every song doesn't have that um, that spark that I, I feel at the moment. So every song on that album practically came from a, a different moment that I was like trying to figure out how to articulate mm -hmm. what I'm feeling and how I am going through uh, relationships and just being an adult right. and yeah. being a f wearing all the hats, right? I have mm -hmm. a multitude of hats and um, I really was just, I feel like even now I'm, so, I'm still trying to figure out what are relationships and what is the gravity of the relationship and how do we set these terms and conditions between right. each other and a lot of what's on there um i mean each song title means something to me and it and it means something to a very large effect of what i do just about every day so it's ingrained in me mm -hmm. there's a song on there called dad thoughts and it's everything that i am always going through from myself to others and what people like you had said um think of me and and if i bring some type of positivity because people look at my thoughts, mm -hmm. but I just think of myself as a as a dad. You know right. What so yeah. really terms and conditions I feel like came from just 
months of holding strong and trying mm-hmm. to maintain yeah. and figure out these relationships and maintain these relationships as strong as possible mm-hmm. and figure out like, okay, what are the terms and conditions that you hold me accountable for? That's another right. song title on there, accountability. Yeah. And it might be something different to someone else. You know what I'm saying? So mm. each song is something that I'm just trying to like release at that point. Wow. It, I love that. Question. Yeah. So everybody has their own terms and conditions you know, that comes with their certain situation and you were kind of looking at the fine print of yours. Precisely. Yeah. I love that. (laughs) Uh, So it's fair to say your work is pretty uh, sample heavy at times. Um, And sample flipping is such an important part of hip hop. You, uh, you wrote an essay on your Patreon about uh, sample flipping and YouTube's effect on that process. Uh, could you briefly summarize your thoughts from that essay and what inspired you to write that? Man, honestly, I forgot what I wrote on there, to be honest. But I think I wrote something to the effect of, like, um, maybe never really going online. It was something about, like, going back into vinyl and not feeling like when I'm doing my... It's it, For me, it's like cooking in a way. It's like science. I go through a process. I go from beginning to end, um, and it really starts from how I'm feeling. So I feel from all six senses. And so I really love going to the vinyl and picking out a record and looking at everything and being like, oh, okay, yeah, this was the thing that I was looking for today. This is what I wanted to sample. And YouTube, <laughs> online in general, um, I just really honed in on sampling from YouTube for real. And I know that's like probably like the most normal at this point for most cats out there. There's still a lot of crate diggers and even cats that really love those early 90s to even 2000s to even some of us in like blog era, we still was into like digging, but then like, look like YouTube and looking online mostly looking online even before YouTube like LimeWire and and digging through sound bites that to me was like that's crazy man because mm-hmm. even before vinyl like when I was at at home as a kid I would I would sample from the radio dude like I would yeah. I would oh get cassettes and <clears throat> and I would sample from Friday nights dude when I forgot his name it was just one of these DJs and he was on um, 96.5 and he would be able to mix so many different new songs in such a short amount of time mm. and I would m- remember asking my dad like how do you make these mixtapes you know I was always right. just trying to, and it didn't call it a mixtape I just called it like how do you make a mix of songs on this for me mm. and he was like put it on the cassette and from the cassette, I would record it into the CD because all I had was a CD player. He didn't give me a um, CD player and, or a cassette player until it was like a boombox that I had. And then I got cassettes. It was like a, a cameo cassette that I got mm-hmm. that had like candy on it and just was like a best hits or something like that. So basically the, the whole thing was I used YouTube after just figuring out like there's just certain stuff I wanted to sample and I kind of like bigged up YouTube at this point and just seeing how different it's been and how many things I've been able to like really find immediately and just go crazy on stuff now dude. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying it's like a Pandora's box at this point that's awesome (laughs) uh yeah I um I wanted to share, like, my when, I guess, going back, uh, my childhood was, like, I, 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 the other day I was uh, talking to somebody about, like, what it was like before, like, the simple days of our childhood, because we, we, we're the, like, the last generation, I feel, that knows what it's like to be in, like, a pre-internet, kind of pre- technological era uh because uh i grew up with magnetic tape you know uh and when i was young uh the most technological thing i did was similar to you where i had a uh cassette recorder and i would record 
songs from TV commercials or songs from the radio next to the speaker and then go into the backyard and then play with my dog while listening to them played back of my own mixtape of my making. That's amazing. But, but, um, I remember when I, my first introduction to sampling was this uh, show on YouTube called Rhythm Roulette. <laughs> and, uh, oh my gosh, it was the most inspiring. I remember seeing Ninth Wonder and Big Crit. Uh, ma- for those who don't know, uh, Rhythm Roulette is a show where they take producers at the top of their game and put them in a record store, blindfold them, have them feel out, find three different records. They take them back to the studio and then they make a song right, by sample flipping them. And uh, especially the Ninth Wonder and Big Crit episodes, those ones inspired me so much that I, I immediately like learned how to sample flip. And oh, uh, I That's started awesome. getting the like uh, understanding what the ear for it is when you start hearing samples out in public. Or, or you like uh, you start hearing things and you're like, oh, that could be sampled. And you, I downloaded who sampled on my phone. You know, I was, I was, I was, I was getting oh, there. I was, and so, <laughs> just really immersing myself in that. And uh, so yeah, uh, yeah. Rhythm roulette, dude. Rhythm roulette is Rhythm really incredible. Roulette is a, it's a. It's if I can a cool just speak on that, dude, yeah, because that is a crucial part of. The culture, man, that that started big up mass appeal, dog. Big up mm-hmm. mass appeal. Cause I appreciate them doing that and and showcasing some of the smaller producers too. Not smaller, I don't want to say that. Let me refrain, um, rephrase that. I would say producers that have commercial success and mainstream popular, um, that are all able to like cascade pretty much internationally, but then also some of like really cool underground folks like oh no mm. was on there too which who's mad lib's brother um i i don't know if ross g rest in peace i don't know if he was on there but um i think some of the other cats from like low end theory but like that's really what made me think about it as well because mm. i started seeing my favorites ninth wonder yeah. little brother you know what i mean yeah. and, and then you started seeing like the fact that they use some of the same software as you did perhaps a lot of ableton users a lot of logic users and then some people didn't even use uh daws or even traditional things dude that's the crazy that was the coolest thing man seeing people use like like you had said um commercials yeah and like video game Mm -hmm. um you know media oh yeah dude rhythm roulette (laughs) Yeah, I, I, when I got into it, I was, I, I was thinking, I had that moment where I was like, do I want to, do I want to be a producer? Or do I want to start fa- sample flipping? And I realized, <laughs> you, but I quickly realized, like, you have to dedicate your life to this. It's no joke. Uh, the work is infinite, um, and never finished. And that reminds me of a, a quote by uh, James Rhodes that I always come back to. Uh, his quote, uh, original quote is, there are 88 keys on the piano, but within that, an entire universe. That's and when I first heard it, it was somebody else quoting him kind of, uh, uh, and their, their, their uh, quote, it was, a, it was the answer to a question. It was a, it was an opera singer who was being interviewed on NPR. And she said, uh, she was asked, uh, do you ever run out of music? Like, to make her like and she said there are 88 keys on the piano but you never run out of music and uh which is just another uh, of way of phrasing that which i i really loved it music is infinite because the human experience is infinite you know and so we may be limited to a certain amount of keys or from our, our our spectrum of hearing but it is it is truly infinite and so the work is never done when as a producer you know that but that's what makes it so beautiful as well is because there is no just as as well with music i uh, i remember having a conversation with casey powell about um what if we uh, theoretically what if uh because we're having the same conversation theoretically what if somebody knew suddenly knew there all there was to music this impossible thing mm-hmm. one day they're like well i know it all <laughs> then uh, we talked about how the next day they woke up they would be 
flummoxed because they'd realize 10 new things had just came out, 10 new innovations had just came out. And so the, mm-hmm. and their knowing everything only lasted maybe about 24 hours because it's, it's changing and innovating exponentially mm-hmm. uh, all the time. Um, Great metaphors. Yeah. Shout out Casey. Shout out Casey. Uh, Man. Is there a specific genre or era that you love to sample from? Yowzers. That's a good question. I don't look for a certain... Yeah, I don't go for a certain specific era. I I know when I was first getting into this, I was like, you know, you're emulating a lot. You're figuring out, like, what can I do to make this feel like what I've already heard? Right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So yeah. I've, I'm like... Between knowing who I like and what I like, it still wasn't who I am. So I was just mm. sampling, you know, my first record, bro. When I the first record I bought was at Phil's record store, like up in northern Kentucky, and it was Marvin Gaye. Um it was the um oh man, I'm blanking. Oh man. Um Inside the Love. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. But this record basically like jump started me into looking for more soul. Records in general, my dad had a, a pretty nice collection. He got me into of course like Michael Jackson and a lot of like the classics, you know, Commodores. Earth, Wind, and Fire, Prince, um, Funkadelic, Parliament. So a lot of like your curated funk, soul, and then even Diana Ross, uh, Shaka Khan. Like a lot of that was already in the household. And there was already records there. There was already cassettes and records. And then I sampled from the radio to cassette to CD. So it was already like the sounds were already there from that era and the radio would already play things like Frankie Beverly and Maze at my grandparents' place or I would listen to like Luther Vandross. So I was already listening to this and then I would notice samples that used this. First time I, I remember wondering about sampling, it was about, um, it was an afternoon when I came home from school, maybe in high school and I was probably like in a sophomore. I know I was like 16 or something like that. Because I wasn't really sampling. When I started making music, I was really just playing the thing. I was just trying to play the thing that I felt. So it was just a lot of key things and reusing like just ideas basically. But I remember listening to Lupe Fiasco's Kick Push. And I was Mm. like, what? I asked my dad, I was like, how did he get this thing to get this thing? And he's like, well, he probably didn't do that. I was like, what do you mean? He didn't make the music? And I started figuring out, like, wait, the guy that I look up to, Lupe Fiasco, the one that I went and bought the CD from, didn't make all the music. Right. And I was curious, like, so who made the music? And when the CD came out, that's when I really figured out what sampling was and how that really was a multi-step process. Mm. And knowing that it was a sample, then there was another amount of like drums that were put on there and then figuring out where that era came from and then figuring out like, oh, a lot of music sampled from this time period. Oh, I need to get more of this music. And I started going for Marvin Gaye and and then it just trickled down to that. Fast forward a little bit. um, Like as everyone started like getting the internet, dude, and started figuring out like, well, we want to do things a little bit differently. And I started finding way more producers at this point that weren't just on the back of the CD at this point. So I'm like, wait, who who, who are these cats? What are they doing out Mm -hmm. here? And it was just, I was really into like underground DJs that were like almost like acid rap in a way that was like almost rock rap in a way, like very turntablism, um, just a lot of like scratching. So the idea of not just soul samples was already embedded in me. I remember just listening to a lot of like scratching 
and it was scratching just a bunch like I did hear a lot of um what's that song called um Rage Against the Machine like a lot of Rage oh, Against the Machine yeah. I forget one of the songs though Killing in the Name of Yes yes yeah. dude so when I heard a lot of that and even um Lincoln Park and mm. um Fort Minor and I started listening to like, okay, it's not just soul samples that make hip hop. Right, right. Right. So that's when I was like, wait a minute, I can sample anything at this mm-hmm. point, dude. So it started out from me knowing the music, seeing where some of my favorite people came through, then figuring out like, okay, the internet with all these other producers, really the other producers were like Ninth Wonder. I started finding him and Mad Lib at that point, Jay Dilla. And when I found out what they were doing in sampling, I was like, oh, you don't have to just sample from Motown. You don't have to just go, you know, to like, um, you know, Tennessee and Mm -hmm. get stuff from down there. Right. You know, so, yeah, dude, um, just to answer that, I I sample anything now. (laughs) Like, I sample so many random sounds even, like, even from YouTube and online. That's awesome. (laughs) Uh, I I gotta ask... um, because I, I feel like I've had this, and I feel like I had this in my very short time of, like, being in the sample flipping culture or just, like, learning about it. But uh, I feel like this happens to a lot of producers. I wonder if it's ever happened to you. Do you have any, like, memorable stories of, like, walking into a CVS and, like, hearing a song? And you're like, has anybody, what is this? Yeah. What was that drum <laughs> fill just now? I need to sample this. Dude, like... All the time, to be All honest. Like, yeah. And it's so funny because I remember as a kid, we go to these outlet malls, man, just around like Indiana, Ohio, and mm-hmm. out in the country, like down in Kentucky even, and like towards the western part of um, Virginia. And we'd be walking around, my grandparents and my sister and I, and we would look at just random stores, dude, and music and all these random stores would be playing and I'd be like, whoa, where's that from? And this was before we had phones to be able to tell us, like, what is that song? Yeah, yeah. So oh my gosh. I really had to figure out, like, what was either, because it wasn't like, I couldn't find, like, what was the song? I, so I was like, what was the thing that I could capture immediately? So I was like, mm. what was that phrase? What did they say? Right. Yes. And then I'd maybe try to ask my grandparents at the most. And then mm-hmm. I try to ask the people, um, what was it, FYE? Mm-hmm. So like <laughs> I'd be in there some of the most of the times, honestly, like just looking, but then listening as well. Mm-hmm. And all the new stuff would just be there. And it wouldn't be easy to find like I guess like subversive things, like things that just were kind of like awkward and weird because i'd be looking for the craziest stuff dude yeah like the weirdest hip-hop like the most off-wall stuff man i I remember that's when i found like gorillas and stuff you know what i mean like Mm. before it was like super on the mtv and stuff yeah so like yeah dude i would listen for phrases and like outlet malls um even i remember at like baseball games uh, when i was playing baseball as a kid people would bring like the radio and we would be listening to the radio and just like mm-hmm. having that play on the side and me like practicing and whatnot and then sometimes I get distracted and be like what was that like yeah you know what I mean and it it make me feel like I know that I like these things and I want to be around these things and I mm-hmm. like the idea of um just listening to it lastly like to like put a pin in that i i found a sample one time in college when i was on hold i was listening oh, on awesome. hold <laughs> and this music was playing i was like who is this, <laughs> this is crazy. and and like i used like i i thought about the phrase i was like what i try to keep on like so this is the refrain mm. and i found it dude oh. and <laughs> Back then, I was using, like, GarageBand, so I, like, mm. chopped it up in there, and That's awesome. <laughs> it was hilarious. But I was like, dude, this is awesome, and and I wish I could remember that again, but I kind of remember the melody, but yeah. 
<laughs> it's always the lyrics that you hold on to for dear life when when you when you walk somewhere and you hear something and it's only fleeting for a moment and you're or you have it right in front of you and there's just no way to sample it or, or there's no way to to just run that uh, uh Shazam in the background or whatever Damn, and uh yeah and before Shazam I you just sparked like a core memory of me like a not core but I was uh, I was at Ear Ecstasy when I'd first moved to Louisville uh, which was a record store that used to be in town. It was pretty, pretty big. And um, I walked in, I was young, and um, they were playing Budo's Band, mm. which is this it's, it's instrumental band that's like, they kind of, I remember wa- hearing it, it sound, this sounds like superhero music, like a superhero <laughs> so walkout cool. music or something. And I was like, this sounds great. And it was, that, that's like, perhaps the last time I was able to walk up to the counter and be like, what is this? And the guy would be like, here's the record. You want me to like, let's, sure, let's, no. let me talk to you about it. And, and cause usually I, I've had that experience before where I walked in a record store again and I was expecting the same thing. And I, I was, uh, I was like, what song is this? And, he, and the guy was just like, it's song Pandora, whatever's on the radio. Mm, you know, that is true. Yeah. So we kind of, moved towards like uh, and then you know as a, it's on my playlist and, I, and yeah it's just it's on the playlist but um Dude. oh that's so true and the idea of having that thorough conversation at the record store man like i used to live in cincinnati no- northern kentucky for a little bit okay. and um near the like madison theater there was a couple of record stores up there bro and it became like a thing that i would be able to like pick up records I became like a crate digger at this point, mm. like in undergrad, but picking up records from Phil's and then going into Cincinnati and mm-hmm. picking up records there, the cats knew what was going on. Yeah, you know they I mean? knew what they, you were doing. they could tell you, oh, you you got this one. It's like, oh yeah. man, you gotta enjoy this. Like, yeah. This is a rare one. And, you know, That's you awesome. felt like yeah. I'm investing in in really good quality history yeah. here. You yeah. Know? The moments where we're fulfilled at that point from entering the store getting everything feeling so welcome and then sometimes getting discounts on that and mm. you become such a regular bro it's you just it's like you felt like family at that point yeah yeah and that there's something to be said about that uh going to an establishment and being known and being a regular somewhere it's just mm. it feels like we've kind of gotten a bit further from that i uh there's this guy uh tim shouts out tim uh musicians Shout den in Evansville, Indiana, it is a two and a half hour drive, mm. or about two hour drive away. Um, and he's just this guy who works on guitars, and he he does it because it's therapeutic to him. And I feel I I feel like less and less you can like have a guy for something that you feel comfortable bringing your mm. stuff to, or so a mentor or something to, and. He's a guy I can just bring my guitar to and he gets it done. Like he just fixes it right in front of me and then sends me on my way. And whereas, uh, you know, a lot of shops, you know, they're in the city, you know, no, nothing, uh, nothing against them, but it's just that they're way busier. You know, mm-hmm. they have a lot more going on. There's a, they're in a big city, so they, they're backed up. They have a lot of guitars and equipment going towards them. And so I, I love being able to just drive out of the, of the town and out of the state and just, uh, meeting my guy, having a guy is like my my guitar guy Mm -hmm. and and so having a and having a guy that you went to like what sample is this and he's like oh you so now you're really getting into it now you're doing this or saying this is a rare one like it's like oh that means a lot more coming from that means the most coming from that person because that's like you're you're looking up to them you know you're you're seeking them as a mentor Mm -hmm. um so um you've mentioned uh on your patreon again um your method of sampling uh you do it via Logic Pro and a vinyl record player. Is that true? Yeah, practically. <laughs> so I've seen this happen on Rhythm Roulette, but can you explain to me, because I'm just curious how, because of course, you know, with YouTube, you just, you know, download it, boom, chop it, it's, mm. it's in there. But how do you get the record this analog medium into a digital medium? Is it as simple as just plugging the record into your interface or uh how does that work with older records of record players or is it is it the modernness of the record player that allows you to just plug it directly in like di or how does that work definitely dude yeah it's so i use a stanton um and it just 
there's a couple of ways you can hook it up into the interface. Mm-hmm. And I view it simply at this point. I use USB to, I think it's like micro USB. Not micro. Wait, the one right before C? Yeah. It's pretty big. It's the larger one that. Oh, like a printer one. Practically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I hook that in there and it reads it as like audio deck. And so mm, I okay. do digital interface at that so point. the input is audio deck precisely okay. yes and once i'm able to i hooked everything to i just have two speakers and a subwoofer so mm-hmm. i hook everything digitally through the vinyl and then i'm lis- listening basically and right at that point it's going into logic and mm-hmm. i sometimes just have full days where i'm just going from record to record just oh, yeah. taking samples and not doing anything with them and i just mm-hmm have a bunch of either and I don't call them chops yet I call them just I mean they're just like <sighs> you you ever play Pikmin yeah <laughs> it's just yeah. like Pikmin to me almost yeah. like where they're like little colors and they're little pieces of personalities that mm-hmm. I can eventually mesh with other ones and they can all be the same color if I want to mm-hmm. but right now they're just each little Pikmin that can mm-hmm. potentially be their own thing or some of the colors can mesh together, but I really just like hold it all into logic at that point. And uh, yeah, I don't really sample vinyl into anything else right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I was wondering, yeah, I guess, is there like a, do you pull, pull up the input volume on the record player or is that your interface? You just turn the gain up or do you not even have to, yeah, yeah. you just turn the gain up on there? Uh, so yeah, when I, first hook everything in doesn't have the best uh like it would be probably better if i hook this directly into like a mixer that gave it some type of like preamp almost right right? because the power is so low on it so oh so maybe providing phantom power might be probably something that could help might be a thing so still got to get that like hooked up properly Mm -hmm. i i am still learning how to (laughs) how to hook up everything but I usually just literally mix. I use uh, I use plugins and Logic to make the mix sound better even before I export it because I export it after I get it into Logic and then I do other little things to it. So, yeah, dude, I I import yeah import from the vinyl into Logic and then do what I need to do for the mix to make it sound like okay, this sounds like it can hold its own. And that's really what I think about is like, all right, does it have enough enough personality? And can I hear every little thing? Headphones. And then I take the headphones off of speakers. I'm like, okay, solid. Keep going. Gotcha. <laughs> Definitely <Okay>. good. <laughs> so you use uh, Logic Pro uh, for sampling. Uh, do you use any other DAWs? I do. I, I can use quite a few different DAWs, uh, but my main source of like creative outlet is of course sampling into logic and really like mixing that but then i use native instruments machine so and i think some people say machina but like i mostly chop i take the samples from logic and i export them into just a folder and so i go into native instruments and then from machine i take the samples and it's from drums to just transitional sounds to effects to all sorts of little plugins to help me make it even better and and buff it up Mm -hmm. and i use all those little tools and i practically chop the music into that and i figure out like okay so i want to have so many either samples or so many sounds and i make my full song from that that standpoint yeah Um, i was also going to say like sometimes i even go into koala And Mm. just use that as well. So between Machine and then Koala, and Koala is a, it's practically an app on your tablet or your phone. And you practically can even sample from your phone if you already have phone uh, samples already inputted. Or if you just want to, you could probably just record stuff right then and there and just start sampling um, from the internet right on your phone and just start chopping up samples there, dude. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I remember hearing Jans talk about uh, Koala 
when that first came out and I was like, oh man, I'm already past <laughs> past this. Oh, that man. is that is so cool. Um it's very fun. I, I've always wanted to I, I've always joked about uh the ultimate Thanos glove for me mm-hmm. would ha- have all the Dawes <laughs> in each. <laughs> and so I'd be able to walk into any studio. Bro. And just, th- that would be such a superpower to walk into any studio in the industry and just be able to sit down and just be comfortable and know what you're doing. Yeah. Right. Oh, uh, there's, there does seem to be, have you, have you picked, I, I, I'm sure you picked up on this, but there does seem to be maybe more in the audio engineering uh, and tracking, uh, mixing and mastering culture but there seems to be a warring uh daw culture have you <laughs> noticed this i've seen like memes and stuff yeah but like <laughs> I, I i uh i just i i feel uh whatever daw whatever software you use yeah, yeah. they're they're just the same set of tools but with a different brand or a different user interface Practically. and so it's always about the person behind it you know and Truly. i think you know, shouts out to Audacity. Ah, Audacity real, was man. there for you when nobody else was. Golly, bro. the goat N- was man. always there for you. Like when GarageBand even wasn't there for, for re- you. I was just gonna GarageBand's say, GarageBand's always been there for you. But I mean, Audacity though. Audacity. Like, it was. It was. That was that X, like Windows ninety eight situation, yeah, bro. And but Audacity, you know, pe- no, there's no hate for Audacity out here. No, it was always. Always there for you, and Still a lot available. of perf- a lot of professional uh, 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 podcasts, and like th- I see them using Audacity to this day. To this bro. day, yes. and I'm like, there's something to be said about just the reliability of that, you know, just tremendously. Like, don't don't fix what ain't broke, kind of thing, right? You know? And it's cascaded over generations of mm. operating systems. At yeah, this point, bro. I'm very curious to see how it's developed over the years, or how it hasn't changed over That's the years. That's true, right? Like, it it looks either, the same. Like, I does think. it? Does it? Yeah, the use. The, there was obviously no huge user interface graphic overhaul mm-hmm. that occurred, <laughs> but. Uh, I, I'm curious of like plugins and stuff, like what yeah. what what they've done with that, or if they've done anything at all. If they if they have the same mindset of like, hey, and I'm not sure if it was ever supposed to be like a a paid thing, like a when when Win, WinRAR came out. If you remember WinRAR, the the goat be like, hey, your <sighs> your your session's expired, but we're still gonna like let you let use you it go through. infinitely. Bro, <laughs> shouts out to WinRAR. Golly, uh, shouts out Audacity. Shouts out GarageBand. So GarageBand is uh, how I started. Um, Where I started in my car. Um, it was like when COVID hit. It was like a a, a bit before, and uh, I had a friend and uh, uh, Naraya. We're we're in a band together, and or but he he was doing a solo project, and he um he needed some vocals uh, recorded, mm-hmm. and I had never done anything like that before. So we used my iPhone in my car dope, dope. with GarageBand. And I was kind of blown away by the quality of uh, the microphone at first, but then I—that's where I started. Was in a car because uh, the car is like actually a, a great sound booth. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I I initially had the idea when I was on the highway and I was had the window down. You know, blowing a little smoke out the window, and then I, I as the window heard uh, rolled up, I heard a, and I was like, "This is a sound booth." This is good. This would be great for vocals. That's a great, yes. And so intuition, bro. <laughs> absolutely. Um, so before we uh, move on from that, for all the gear guys and gals out there, uh, yeah, yeah. what is uh, what kind of gear do you use? Like, what is your MPC or your interface? Uh, your your computer? Just just uh, if you free if, in in anything you don't wish to divulge. Of course. No, it's all good. Um, because, like you said, I feel like they're all practically the same. Yeah. And honestly, same like set I of could, tools. Right. I could use, honest, because it, it started from playing drums and whatnot. You know what I mean? Mm. Getting with physical recorders and drums and doing all that stuff, dude. So I would say if I can have a computer. That would be cool. So a computer would be awesome, and then a, a monitor, like a PC, like a well, like a Mac. a Mac. I use Mac, so I still go through Logic and Native Instruments. Mm-hmm. It's been a while since I've made music on a PC, though, since I've been on like Windows. And yeah, um, I I had tried like back in high school Fruity Loops. Back when Fruity Loops was 
Fruity Loops and yeah. when I saw Soldier Boy and still Life Wonders today. Yes, still being used today, dude. And that interface has changed tremendously, but mm-hmm. slightly has it in a way too. Yeah. Been kind of rooted in the same. Um, but I would say being able to have a vinyl player and sample vinyl, like that's my biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Um and so vinyl, a vinyl player. I have my computer, monitor. Uh, I just use a keyboard and mouse. Um, I I do like to have like an ergonomic mouse because I am clicking and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But I'm not like on the computer that much, so I'm mostly on. So I use machine, which has its own. Basically, like it's like an MPC, but it's basically a sampler physically. And it mm. also does a multitude of other things. It allows me to control the doll, essentially. So mm. I don't have to look at my doll all the time, which is what I love. I yeah. love the the flexibility of like, okay, I did Logic, which was semi-analog digital. Then I did a little bit of digital manipulation through the mix. But then I like to go back to setting it all up digitally and then like immediately coming back out and being like, okay, I'm doing all this from i don't even have a name for but like it's just like the um sampler for me so i just use like my lady she calls it a machine box (laughs) so or like the uh yeah basically the machine box but it is the machine and it's called the machine studio Mm -hmm. and i mostly sample from there i'm manipulating i'm chopping physically like i don't chop really through the computer i'm not a a click chopper i'm a i still play my chops out Mm -hmm. and i still manipulate things through the knobs and uh that's really what my biggest thing is is i like physical manipulation more so right yeah Yeah. there's something to be said about the physically like when you're actually touching your npc and like there's something that is and anything to become more physical with the music you know Mm -hmm. it's this thing that's it's it's so tangible emotionally but intangible physically but Mm -hmm. uh it definitely affects uh, affects the tangible world in in such a profound way but it remains invisible into the human eye in some way that's so but not to the human heart of course (laughs) that's such a great way of putting that oh man yeah. Uh, do you have you ever uh, thought of like a? Well, first first off, I want to. Uh, I had a thought about FL Studio that I just want to shout out FL yeah, Studio yeah. for the designers of them. I love how FL Studio visualizes busing. <laughs> <laughs> it has an actual string attached yeah, yeah, yeah. from the one track to the bus channel, mm-hmm. and so that you can see that they're linked. And I thought that is so brilliant than just to have. Oh, bus 22 is, is on track 22 and mm-hmm. it, it's, it has a physical connector. And I thought that's such a brilliant way to visualize what's happening there. Because busing initially Bro. can seem like, what's, how, what's going on here? And, but that makes it so much easier. So the designers of FL Studio for doing that, props to them for giving Bro. a real cool visual there of like where, what's happening in your mix. Like what, what is affecting what, you know, instead of it just being mm-hmm. so... You know, it's it seems more human than just like the it's number sets. Uh, also, shout out Reason too for doing that. I don't know if you oh, no, have I, ever played with Reason. Never, before. never. Oh, Yowzers! So that's a good one. That was on the PC as well. Reason had a lot of like you see the front of what the interface is. You see like okay, this is the knobs and all that, mm. but then you had the ability to turn it around and connect different like compressor oh, to the mixer wow and, like oh no my way. goodness if you that i think cool. you can still download like trials and whatnot but mm-hmm. i feel like you would thoroughly have oh it's wow. like a jungle gym bro it's so fun wow so it, it emulates a physical environment precisely for you to plug in your quarter inch cables and stuff too oh yeah. that's insane and it looks and they just it looks like animated too so you're like really oh. holding it and it and like the cord dangles wow. and whatnot it's and like a video game practically yeah dude oh, it's like a, a flash game you'd play dude. like back in the day that'd be like this Man, is awesome. flash player <laughs> oh, shouts out yeah shouts out Golly. our flash games back in the day 
keeping us in trouble in school. Um, and not doing our homework. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> but uh, yeah, some of those those games back then were yeah they were super addictive. Just like I, I all I remember is like the 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 stick man games. Mm-hmm. Uh, you and a friend, you'd have like one move. And so you'd be like, you'd be able to do one action and one stick on the other side. Very like mental. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We thought we were playing chess over there. For real. <laughs> yeah. So we were playing flash games on Newgrounds. Oh, man. Uh, similarly, how do you know when a beat is complete? Is it intuition, empirical evidence, or something else? Mm, complete. Is a beat ever complete? <laughs> is a beat ever complete? Right. I I feel like there's there's a lot of what we want to say, and we try to articulate as best as possible in a very short amount of thing. We even call them elevator pitches. We try yeah. to right. We try mm-hmm. to put them in things called thesis, you know. Or mm-hmm. I have a dissertation of all the things that I've learned, or I've I've put in. Um, so many hours and I don't know if I said everything that I need to say. And I sometimes still feel like that, even when I'm walking away from an album, but I immediately still feel like I had everything I need to say at that point for this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, It tells me to be honest, like I'll listen to So I listen to my heart for real, and I go from what was I feeling to what was I trying to convey, and really did I get the message across clear enough, and really, like, did I have, because I'm trying to have fun too, man, during all this thing, so while I'm going through this whole sampling process, it's just me messing around with a bunch of stuff and experimenting and figuring out like, is this knocking or not? Or is mm-hmm. this like, is this, is the loop turning around beautifully? Mm-hmm. Um, I tell you, so there is a, there is a point where I know like, this is it. Cause I'll mm-hmm. be like, I'll be in the process of making something. And like, Oh snap, yeah. this is getting better. And I'm like, mm-hmm. this is becoming in itself. Like, oh, there's nothing else that this could be but -hmm. this. And then I'm like, oh, this could be added, but it's not going to dilute this. And usually I'll have to separate myself. I have to like disassociate myself from the beat. And it goes back to my heart feeling like, can I listen to this on loop and feel super comfortable and provide like the emotion that I was feeling, a, a landscape of like infinite possibilities. If I can feel like infinite possibilities are, are present within the song. And it's not about like, what can you do with the song? It's like, I can think of anything while I'm listening to this because I'll just have it on loop. And it'll sometimes be like just the loop. It'll be like an eight or a 16 bar loop maybe, or even a four bar loop. And then sometimes it's even just, the full two minute song that I've arranged myself and I've made like drops here and there. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. if I can listen to this wholeheartedly and feel like, Ooh, I feel something. I got across what I wanted to get across. It's sounding more and more interesting. And I'm like, Oh yeah, this was fun. If I have Mm -hmm. all those things occur then I'm like, all right, I don't really need to do anything else. Like you, you are telling me what to do at this point. Right. Right. I, I was telling you how to do it all. But now, like I said, I disassociated myself and I, I'm just letting you loop. And you're telling me all the things that could happen. Like you're going back to all the possibilities of either, oh, yeah, an MC could get on this or maybe someone can sing on this or not even vocals at all. I can just listen to this all by itself and it feels so amazing. And I don't even have to think about it. It's just there. And that to me is like an overwhelming feeling of like, there's a, it's like your body going through a bunch of stuff, man. And, and like I said, it's like cooking, you know, when you get done with the dish, you could just add the whole daggone seasoning of the cabinetry, but there's certain things that you've done. And once the food starts talking to you, it's like, oh, 
dang on. Yeah. Like, oh my goodness. You you actually you're telling me the multiple it's almost like with Gordon Ramsay or or any really particular chef is describing the dish. They're like, they're telling you the layers and the notes. The food is telling them this and they're conveying that. And I can tell when people and I'm I'm a very visual, it's weird. I'm visual with sound. So I can see how people hear things with it. And that tells me like, oh, the feeling came back. I felt like it was done. It's definitely done since mm-hmm. they're feeling it too. And and I know like even if it's not the best thing ever, it was it was finalized for my moment at that point. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That was a great answer. Um, Thank you, bro. you mentioned visual, like you 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 mix almost visually. Like yeah. I, I remember when I um started audio engineering, there was a a series from like the nineteen late nineteen eighties or early nineties where this guy was doing a course on visual mixing, and that was really neat. It it almost seems like a basics course now, but it was to me, and I think still is this kind of abstract idea of like visual mixing, as in like placing like knowing the sonic area in which that it can be almost described as like a single speaker cone mm-hmm. going out to the audience. And it's like, where are you placing, say, like, okay, the bass drum, that's probably going to go right in the middle. Uh, that's a good mono place for that to be. So it's a, and then, but the snare drum, it's like, hmm, does the snare drum go right in the middle? It's like, well, look at a drum set. It's actually just a bit to the left. And so you actually pan it just a bit to the left. And then it's like, what about the cymbals? Okay, now let's get let's get pretty creative. We can have it splash on the right because that's where uh, like the crash can be on one side and the hi-hat can be on the other side because that's where they are. Uh, and you start getting into this really unique panning and stereo kind of layering. And uh, seeing it as a visual is really helpful to me mm-hmm. and I think to a lot of people. And so it was cool that you just mentioned visual mixing. Um, <clears throat> moving on from that, um, uh, you you mentioned, uh, we've we've talked about Ninth Wonder um, who do you, who do you look up to as like a producer today? Like somebody who is just, you, you look up to and you're like, I am inspired by like, this person every day. Dang oh. on. Just one person. Uh, it, it, can be, it can be multiple producers oh, for man. sure. Absolutely. Producers, man. Well, honestly, like on a day to day, just normal basis, bro. Like, a lot of these younger cats out here in the city, to be honest. I no, really yeah. want to big them up. Um, and I don't even think of them as like younger cats. I, I really just see them as um musical enthusiasts as myself. You know, you you mentioned me as a sound enthusiast, and like that just recently came about because I was trying to articulate the feelings once again that I have mm. always had with sound, and I just like I like putting swag behind it. So when I see people as enthusiastic in sound as I am, I'm like, oh, they have something extremely special within them. And for years, I have been looking for that from within the city in, in some capacity to mm-hmm. see like, man, I want to see someone with some crazy drums. I want to see someone with crazy sampling techniques. I want to hear someone out of their mind going bonkers, flipping things that I've never heard flip before. and. Mm-hmm. There's cats that have moved here, um, a lot of implants that have really made this city like with beautiful life. And it's it's like gravity. It's almost like I don't know if y'all if you've ever seen WandaVision, but I like I actually watched you it. You actually all. said you've seen it all. I, I have not seen many of the films for <laughs> some awesome. reason I saw that one. So the way she creates that town, bro, yeah. and the way that she makes her own world essentially you Mm -hmm. know what i'm saying that formulated emotional creation Mm -hmm. i look up to cats like that so big up to shy to private who just released some things man shy as well releasing some things um roly axel roly round tree yes Mm -hmm. um been hearing axel beats for a long time oh man axel bro like 
that cat has inspired me wholeheartedly. I miss the uh, shout out to those like little ciphers they had too with the beat ciphers, man. Mm-hmm. That's where I first met Hendo. Um, shout out Hendo Houdini. And um, let me see who else. Uh, there's so many Kodas producers. Uh, Raw. Um, uh, Khalil. You know, all these cats really like inspire me because it's so close knit now. I feel like we are the low end theory here of the city. So it's not like. Mm. Like, I feel so a part of it that I am the role model for myself at this point. Like, mm-hmm. I see all these other cats doing it to such a high level. I'm like, I got to do it at a high level, too, oh, now. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Absolutely. But outside the city, though, I'd say for the longest time, as far as, like, OG inspiration, right? Um, gonna have to go back to, like, a lot of me finding blog error type of folks. Um, mm-hmm. So I'll say some new folks. So like Obliv, you know what I'm saying? I was just listening to Obliv on my way here. Obliv, right up there, right next to Knowledge. Knowledge is one of our, like, he's one of our goats. Mm-hmm. Um, always watching his Twitch streaming. And I'm going to say some more traditional folks too, like Rest in Peace Ross G, you know, big, big guy that I've really been into Ross G is one of those like founders of like low end theory type stuff. Flying Lotus, Flying Lotus, Ross G, Dibiase, mm. Sam I Am, mm. and Knowledge. Like all those cats really f- formed my way of thinking when it came to sampling and an after one too. Um, they really f- formed, form like had a formula that I was like trying to figure out for years man like i feel like for decades for real since i had figured out what sampling was from kick push with lupe to learning about like online random turntablism the next like era of sampling for me was like obliv and madlib and then like those low end theory cats you know flying lotus sam i am um even like Toki Monster, those cats were really like hidden mental parts that I had never even conceived before. And and I and I'm not giving it enough justice, I feel like, but it was such a huge piece of me and a lot of my peers that it just made us feel like we could be invincible with music. Mm. And it wasn't anything that we couldn't do with music at that point. Um, Yeah, bro. Mind design, you know what I'm saying? Like, those cats really gave me of, of like, a family home. out Because I didn't, I felt like an outsider here. I remember only listening, and around here was, like, snap music and dance music. And so people really wanted, like, dancing music. Or really hardcore, like, and, like, hardcore gangster rap type music. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't a lot of backpack for real music. And I don't even like saying backpack, but just, like, sample heavy, dope loops, dope flips, just beats, no lyrics or anything, just straight up beats. And that's what I'm personally trying to build even to this day right now is a beat culture from Louisville and people look and be like, dad, yeah, Kentucky had, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so and and this and that. And, and as much as I look at LA or cats from Atlanta and see all the crazy things that they're doing even right now. (laughs) Great answer. Thank you, bro. Um, So one thing I am curious about that I kind of, I would imagine, um, I kind of struggle with a bit, but I I usually can get a good answer from the artist, whether they want a modern sound or a more gritty sound, like more, I call them a polished or raw sound. Mm I, I, uh, what the two, uh, the two examples I use for artists when I'm like, what, what do you want your vocals to sound like? You know, cause that's a, it's, there's a lot that goes into that question, but, um, Mm -hmm. uh, I say there's like, there's no right way for a rap vocal to sound uh, because, uh, and there's two opposite ends of the spectrum. As the, and these, this is what I usually use as an example. I say you got all the way on the high 
end of the polish and production uh, scale, we have the Migos. Their vocals are highly polished, heavily produced. I mean, to the T. I mean, they got probably a team of people uh, on on their vocals. <laughs> and then you have Benny the Butcher mm-hmm. or any of the Gazelda team. They're they're going for that raw, gritty. Recorded this in my living room, kind of like. Uh, and I remember seeing uh, the, the the plugs I met, like some behind the scenes footage of when they recorded that, mm. and they were doing it in a kitchen. Mm. And I was like, okay, yeah. So they're ri- and <laughs> and you keep, but there's something that just feels good about that raw grittiness of that that vocal that that it's it's not like so much of a laissez faire or devil may care attitude. It's more like a just this is real raw rap. Mm-hmm. You know, this is almost you you they probably wish you could hear the vinyl cracking under it, <laughs> you know, this, Precisely. that kind of, uh, and then, but some people just really want, I want it, I want to sound like the weekend, you know, and it's like, that's going to be so true. Total, total opposite of that. So when you're making beats, how do you balance like a lo-fi and hi-fi in modern day beat making? So like, there's things like what you sample is going to be on the lo-fi spectrum, but would you master it in a high fidelity way? Like use certain high fidelity uh, modern uh, techniques to make sure, oh, that bass is hitting the right way, you know, mm-hmm. or just like so the bass doesn't sound muddy. Or is there is there anything you do uh, to balance the lo-fi and hi-fi kind of dichotomy when you're when you're mixing a song? Uh, in a way, like. Great question, by the way. I Thank love you. that question. So technology from the standpoint of just getting the song out, like I try to keep it as bare minimum as possible. Mm-hmm. Like I try to only make this like the gain a little bit better or mm-hmm. make it a little bit clear. Like I try to clean it up just a slight bit right. just so I can say like, okay, you're portraying what you need to portray at mm-hmm. this point. And if I'm doing anything, like if I'm adding drums, sometimes I'll go drumless and just use the sample. And it, and that really goes back to source. So like, mm. how's that vinyl really yeah, kicking for me? And and as I said, Logic is where I first start having fun a little bit. So I'm really pushing in like, it sounds a little light. So I do want to like put in a little compressor here. Mm. I want to like EQ it a little bit and... Um, and this is before I even export it to do anything else to it, too. So yeah. sometimes the vinyl already gives me some great things. I don't have to really do too much, but just, like, pump it up a little bit. Right. And then from the export, um, it's like I do use a lot of different plugins here and there, but I really try not to overdo it with that because mm-hmm. it comes back down to source. Like, you start well, it'll end well. So mm-hmm. you really have to make sure your foundation of like everything aligning nothing's clashing too much um and you you really it's just i just try to keep it super simple it's just a lot of eqing to be honest for me like i really just eq a lot there are some really cool things out there i remember seeing uh remember seeing jan's even tweeting about like ai and seeing a lot of cats actually tweeting about like what is it about stem separation or are you still sampling from different places? And mm. and that is a producer conversation. It's oh, yeah. where are you sampling? How are you sampling? Are you using drums and are you not? That there's a whole thing about drumless mm. and drums uh, with the beat essentially. And the whole thing is around t- terminology, technology, and technique. I feel like so. Right. It's a it's a weird conundrum of um, preferences. I feel like it's all preferences at that point because what's it sound like at the end of the day whatever you just did if it sounds dope that's all that matters to me so I would say for me personally I try not to overdo the technology I try to let the thing speak back to me and that comes down to the drums they might already be knocking enough they don't make like every time I'm in there I'm not like oh man this needs to sound like his his name's knots the ruler like this needs to sound like knots now, or like, mm. man, the the bass isn't like dragging enough. It doesn't. It needs to sound like um, some heavy Ross G bass, or like, why isn't the hi hats hidden? It needs to hit. I never really think of it that way. I just I, I listen to the sample. Is it enough? 
just a little here and there. Okay, so we're cool. We're good with the loop. Loop's cool. All right, I had a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I got some percussion here, a couple of sound effects, cool drops here and there. The thing's tell, telling me what to do. I don't have to change it up that much more. Mm -hmm. So I really try to let it speak back to me and tell me, like, do you need a little, you need a little saturation? It's like, okay, right. you need a little saturation. It's like, oh, okay, I, a little high end. All right. A little filter there. All right. A little, little parametric filter. All right. Got you. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> I, I I love that answer. Like, <laughs> let the beat tell you. So, what motivates your creative process? Like, keeps you going, really? Like, uh, doing this day in and day out. Is it the raw emotion of it? Is it, are you chasing technical mastery or a quest for sonic innovation? Mm. What, uh, what is... Or is it simply like your family? Like what? What? Like uh, what are the things that keep you in love with what you do and keep you doing it every day and keep it fresh? Mm. That's a good question. It's like really going back to my why, you know. And mm. sometimes it reinvents itself. It transforms. I feel like it's like practically been the same. When I, so before I even had like my own room in a way, before I even had a space to really call my own, and I really started making music, you know, at 12 years old as a kid, mm -hmm. and then made music once again in undergrad, but still around other people. Um, it was really just like, for the longest time, dude, I never called myself a musician. Like, I never wanted to be like, I'm a musician. Like, I'm out here making music. It was a means to figure out sound design and right. engineering. And I never thought about, I want to make music and be a um, performer or even work with anybody. I, I, was, I wasn't even thinking about that. And I didn't think you could do music other than be a musician, uh, if that mm, makes sense. Yeah. Other than movies and stuff. Other than, like, finding out, like, oh, Foley and sound design? Mm. Okay, cool. So what do you, how do you do that? Well, there's a lot of this that you use. So all this software. So I was like, what is Cubase? And what is Reason? Why am yeah. I using all this? So I'm like, it's, you use it for music? I didn't want to do that. So I just started making stuff and... I wanted to make scores, man. Like, I wanted to do stuff for movies and stuff. So I wanted to learn the software. So it was first technical. I wanted to figure out, and it wasn't software before um, that, before I downloaded all those, like Reason and Cubase and even Fruity Loops. It was my dad's equipment. So I was trying to figure out, how does he do all this stuff? Because he had me play drums for a little bit. And I was like, I was digging it, but I was really into technology. So I was like, how do you record this thing? How right. do you get, what was it? Because my dad's cousin was doing things with a radio show. So he was, he was always like preaching and the preaching was always much more on a, um, like a Fred Hampton Jr. situation where he was practically giving advice to youth in the YMCA and allowing people to figure out ways to overcome you know, poverty-stricken areas, figure out ways to build themselves up all through this radio show. So he was already doing media broadcasting, and I was already kind of around that a lot. Mm -hmm. And then bring in church as well with drums. So I was already trying to be technical as a kid and then technical even in, like, my, my undergrad when I got back into music when I first got a MacBook again mm -hmm. and I started using yeah. GarageBand again. And I was like, so is software stuff you can use now? Because it took me a while to even, like, believe you can do software to really make the thing that I was wanting to make. Because mm. even when I went on to Reason and Cubase, I was still messing around, trying to, <laughs> I was trying to uh, sample from AOL Radio into Reason. AOL Radio. AOL Radio, my brother. That's <laughs> yes. crazy. And trying to get random things on there. And there would be, like, random turntable um, channels, like, not like just hip hop on like uh, a popular thing, but like they, I think they even had like underground hip hop. 
And so I would try to record a lot of the, and I don't know any of these DJs, man, but random spots that they would have me like, okay, this guy's mixing this song. And it'd be like a two minute mix of like three different songs or something like that. And he would just stop it and start and stop it. And then random like female DJs would be there. And I'd be like, oh man, this is so cool. Mm -hmm. Not learning names or anything, just learning like, this is a thing, turntablism. Yeah. Technique, right? Oh, yeah. So technology, technique. And then it became like the passion of like, why do I want to figure out sound so much? Why do I like care about this? And it came from so many things from like getting a piano on Christmas and trying to play um, I Need Love by L.O. Cool J and, and then <laughs> yes. trying to figure out like oh. Stevie Wonder a little bit, dude. And that was really crazy trying to figure out Stevie Wonder. Um, and singing as well. Like, my grandparents sung a whole lot, so I would be, like, trying to figure out, do I sing a lot of this, or can I play some of this? Mm. So I was trying to figure out technique and technology, and the reason why I, like, even got into music again, because I feel like it was discovering Lupe's fiasco's kick push and sampling overall. But it was also like, I just wanted to be good at something mm -hmm. at, a, at a certain degree. Um, not for like vanity or for peers or anything, but like I just wanted to be better at this music thing that I really started at. And the fact that I moved away from my parents' fo my parents' place to undergrad for so long and didn't have any way of making music until the laptop I was like this is just pure fun mm -hmm. so from GarageBand and like really taking loops and sampling and then showing my roommates and showing another friend and then showing another guy who was an MC shout out Dom Betts um, made this song shout called out Dom. shout out Dom B um, Mayor Dom and he had listened to this first song that I sampled. It was called Legitimate. Mm -hmm. And I had sampled a vocal. I was trying to be like Mad Lib, man. I sampled this random vocal, this jazz sample. I played the drums. And I tried to make mm -hmm. it sound like super spacey. And from that point on, when I started seeing people like, oh, man, I really like this. It sounds like something you would make. This sounds yeah. like you. Da -da -da. It was like praise at that point. Yeah. I was like. You, find you guys really uh, some identity in there as well. Exactly. I found like this is something I'm good at and it's something that I can identify with on a large level of an of a spiritual outlet in a way because mm -hmm. everything started connecting a little bit more kind of like what you had said it was like precursors church the radio situation um the community like all of that kind of came together. So to answer the question, you're like, so what makes you, like, continue to go? Right. I went back through a lot of those whys, and I always tell people even now, like, it has to be fun for me. I have to be doing something on a large level of, like, this feels so good. The spark, like we talked about earlier, from randomly hearing the sample. Like, I will randomly hear something, and I'll be like, ooh what was that mm -hmm. okay i i feel like i could do something with that the i feel like i can do something just like when i watch master chef i see mm. these recipes and i'm like bro yeah. i feel like i can do that yeah. like i get this and i love using my hands with everything as i'm yeah. doing with talking but if i if i get the oh i feel like i can do something with that then i'll just go back in and do it yeah um and sometimes there will be days where i just want a sample so how do I maintain what gets me back going in there is I feel like I can do that. And then what maintains me is patience and stepping away from it for a little bit. Yeah. Taking the time away from music puts me back into wanting to do music. Absolutely. And it, it grows in a completely different way. And I start getting different ideas and different tendencies. And I'm like, Oh man, I just stockpiled all this like creative, like, quivers basically and i'm about to like go to town on the sampler and figure out like oh this is technique i want to try now 
I just heard this thing. I want to try to figure out this like stutter technique on the uh, oh, kick or something like that, or like mm. this transitional thing. And I actually want to drop it a little left on like the the three fourth mm. of the beat, not just on the four four. And yeah, just really experimenting and going back into having fun, dude. As to why I was a kid, figuring out like, oh, I actually played the melody. Of Earth, Wind, and Fire. I figured it out. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, that's like... such a good feeling when you're young and you <laughs> played the part. You're like, oh, Brazilian that's... rhythm. It's like, yeah. yeah, dude. Oh, man. That's awesome. Great question. <laughs> um, so in your bio, you say uh, you eat 98% plants. <laughs> and when I pressed you in private, you said the, the other 2% was air. <laughs> uh, yes. Can you tell us uh, just what that what that means to you? Uh, and um, yeah, just t- tell me what what that means to you and why you why you put that out there. Well, I for one, I was being facetious, but like right. it truly was. Um, like at this point in my life, uh, it goes back to the whole like relationship thing, the terms and conditions. You know, what am I holding myself accountable for? And how do I hold myself um, to the best of me? I always want, I have high expectations on myself. I have very, um, I'm very specific on how I get things done and how I, how I react, um, which really that's a new thing I'm trying to work on is responding and not reacting. Mm. So mm. responding well to the, events around me and making sure that I'm honing in on what really matters. Uh, that's like some of the most important things. Um, man, it's, yeah, I'm trying to connect it back to music because it's just how I go about building myself up. I look at everything that I'm already doing and how can I improve it? So that's with my entire relationship with my body, with my family. Mm-hmm. And just to keep it really simple, like I've had a lot of just health issues with family members in general. And that's from family to even friends mm-hmm. and just like living in Kentucky, man. Like oh, yeah. it's not the epitome of like everyone wants to thrive on uh transforming lifestyles you know what i'm saying so we we have a whole foods we got a trader joe's you know we lost a couple of cool fresh marketplaces we have a lot of dope shout um, out amazing grace oh man seriously um and a shout out to a lot of the wonderful small local um markets and the fresh markets and the farmers markets that we have too around town um that relationship with food is really just heavily based off of me wanting to improve myself and mm-hmm. make sure that I'm here to curate what I need to curate, man. Like when when things make sense to me, it makes sense. And I don't really I go back to realign to make sure like, okay, this I, I do go back to question things and say, like, okay, what am I doing for this for? This is why I'm doing it. Okay. And and but then I dig deeper on the why. So plants to me is back to the source it's like getting mm. the best sample getting the best mm. resources to make the best end results it's like how are you gonna expect yourself to be a marvel superhero or to be the best dad or yeah. to be like other aspirations uh like for voice acting or for just in general being able to like lift up a box and put it on something or reach out for something on a shelf and then pull it back down without having to ache in pain and say, I can't do something and I'm out for three days because I'm like eating horribly, sleeping Mm -hmm. horribly and just overall not taking care of myself. So definitely plants are um, my best friend at this point. And uh, deep breathing, that air thing is very important too because it, inhaling deeply and exhaling deeply and allowing yourself to breathe before responding um Mm -hmm. taking the time to like really focus on your breath man like that's the biggest thing yeah i love the idea of uh 
these uh, fresh produce being like this, the getting as close to the source as possible. Same that you do with your, your, your loops or with your music, you try to get as close to the source as possible. Mm-hmm. And so, and, uh, I, I did want to share with you that, um, just passively, you helped me make the decision to, to go, to change my diet almost entirely. Uh, I've, I've gone to, uh, no processed foods, vegetarian, haven't, haven't pulled the vegan switch just yet, but, uh, I, I, it's, and it's completely, you know, changed just how I feel you. I felt like pretty cruddy for the first week. Uh, but then after that, now I've, I can't imagine going back. You know? <laughs> That's exactly I, and uh, that, it, that was in no small part because of you. So I, Dang I on. appreciate that a lot. That's so cool, man. I, I and, really and appreciate that. You mentioned, um, responding instead of reacting that sounds a lot like stoicism uh, yeah i've been looking into that a lot yeah, yeah i love uh i really look up to marcus aurelius Ooh. he was a uh, roman emperor he ruled around uh, 140 a.d mm. and he was a peacetime emperor so uh he he's he's popular a lot because of that but and but be also because of all of his writings uh, he wrote a book called meditations mm. that um he talks about a uh, Stoics. Uh, he 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 knew of Stoics, and it reminds me of this uh, the, one of my favorite Stoic stories. It's there's a, a Stoic philosopher, and Marcus Aurelius even then says his name is lost to time, but um, mm. he's uh, awaiting execution because his uh, his beliefs were against the state at that time, but then later proven to be correct, as some things uh, show out to be. And he was playing uh, chess with the guard. Mm. And when he was called out for his execution, the only emotion he showed was uh, disappointment that he wasn't able to finish his chess game. Mm. And he welcomed death like an old friend. And it was like the, uh, it was the, like the true vision of a stoic. Like, and I've, I always think about that. It's like, how do you, and, and Marcus Aurelius talks about it, anything of, Anything of nature is not anything to be feared. We shouldn't fear of anything of nature. Mm-hmm. And so that Stoke was probably thinking, there's nothing more natural than death. And so I will, I will accept it, you know? Uh, so that, that's, that's pretty, that's I pretty cool. I love that. that. It sounds like you really incorporate some stoicism mm-hmm. into uh, your, uh, your everyday philosophy. Precisely. I love that you brought up Marcus. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's cool. Man. Shouts out Marcus Aurelius. <laughs> So real quick, I wanted to, I say real quick, but, um, I wanted to talk about just kind of, I wanted to discuss your thoughts on AI mm-hmm. and how okay. it's going to be affecting the future of this industry. Okay. So here's my vision and what I've, uh, what I've, I've thought of, um, I absolutely see. So on YouTube, you go on YouTube and of course there's these uh impossible features like Freddie Mercury and the weekend. Like <laughs> they there's whole AI albums of them together and it sounds really good. It used to be like I can kind of tell it's not but then now it's getting kind of scary. It's like I cannot tell that That's this isn't real. Freddie Mercury and the weekend on the record together. That's and crazy. it's it's really nuts. Uh there's so many and like tons of Drake albums that are just out there that are just all AI. So I definitely <laughs> I see a future where Say a AAA rap artist is on vacation and somebody hits him up for a feature and uh, he just tells his audio engineer, yeah, make it happen. He may provide the lyrics. He may not. But uh, you can use your vo- my voice, which is my intellectual property, which I think uh, that'll be discussed a lot more going forward is mm-hmm. everybody's vo- vocals will have to be an intellectual property with their own rights and trademarks because uh, people will use them however they want if if those if that doesn't happen but uh i definitely see a very weird future where uh you get a feature from an artist you pay your money and you get the feature back and you don't know whether they did it or not and what's even crazier to me is a feature where people won't care i i think mm. um i think uh ai mixing i think it'll, it'll it's going to be a lot like auto tune. When auto tune first came out, people were kind of an uproar. I remember listening to NPR 
people are like, it's ruining singing. <laughs> no, <laughs> real singers aren't going right. to, you know, it, it doesn't bring light to real singers anymore. Anybody can do it. It's like, uh, well, it didn't, that didn't really happen. And <laughs> now we kind of settled down. So I, I imagine AI will be kind of the same thing where it kind of takes up certain roles, like, a, but, but that kind of uncanny valley of like, that's my voice singing that song like I would sing it. And, uh, and then the, the point where people just don't care uh, whether the music they're hearing is AI or not. Um, but I also envision a future where instead of like the, um, right where the parental advisory sticker would be, <laughs> it's uh, made with no AI. They mm. wear it, no AI made during this process, it, and it's some. And it would be a selling point, a marketing thing. It's like mm. we made this the the old way, Practically, the original, the real right. way. Yeah, but I Just also like see organic. Is, yeah, you know, I yeah. also see how um, AI will definitely help us with uh, tweaking mixes and stuff, but uh, and and certain automation processes, and there's certain things that it can do like legwork that it can do that adds it just a, mm-hmm. I see it just being I've I've added AI to my tool belt in a lot of ways with a uh, with certain not so much in audio but now I I use in Adobe Premiere I use a camera a camera angle switcher it's mm-hmm. just AI you assign the voice to the person and it knows to switch the camera angle for you it's just like something that would be really just meticulous to do and then you can focus on the real art end oh, of it instead so of the technical cool. side of it holy shnikey one thing that I I believe that is so great about the evolution of technology is what I like to call the democratization of music. Uh, garage band, free plugins, online tutorials on YouTube. It's now, it's no longer a gate-kept sort of skill or, or field. I, I, I just... Uh, and it wasn't necessarily gate kept. It was just there was a huge technological uh, barrier there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think of say if I wanted to record a record in 1960 versus if I want to record a record today. Mm-hmm. In 1960, you have to go to a studio, and you also can't mess up too many times because there's all these stories of bands like they they you, they buy the reel to reel tape and they go in and. Uh, they buy it from the studio and then they're going and then one of them messes up and it's like, we got to throw the whole reel to reel away and we have to buy a new reel to reel tape from the engineer. And like, and so, and so it was a way bigger deal, you know? And, and when they were doing actual edits, physical edits on mm-hmm. like those, the reel to reel tapes or eight track tapes, like actually cutting it and then putting it together Bro. is so, so, so neat it's intricate <laughs> uh but it's just it's so good i feel like that um that everybody is able to like make music mm-hmm. um and i know some some would definitely and i think it's this is just to be said that like of course some people uh, i've i've expressed this to people it's like everybody can make music now because it's so it's democratized now everybody can have it and mm-hmm. it's open source uh anybody can have a good sounding record or whatever and uh, there's two, you know, two schools of thought of there. It's like one's like, well, now anybody can make music, <laughs> and now it's oversaturated with, you know, not so great music or whatever. Mm. But the the, <laughs> the way I like I like looking at it, and I truly do think about it, is that means there's a young Mozart out there who wouldn't have been given the opportunity or chance to to make music, and he's 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 given a chance and is being inspired and will become great. I. I always say like that. I always think like the next, the greatest engineer or greatest producer in the world right now is like an 11 year old kid messing around on their MacBook right now or something. And it's like, yeah, without that technology, like that wouldn't have made that chance may not have been afforded to that child. Exactly. I I love how you put that. Um, and so, um, I want to talk up to you about a, uh, a lighter subject, I just want to okay. talk to you briefly about anime. <laughs> so that's dope. <laughs> which anime original soundtrack do you love the most? What's the one Houses. that you that makes you think that that I don't know? Which one do you idolize the most? Which one do you that comes to mind when you think of great anime soundtracks? Man, because like man, the anime this... are so well known for their banger intros and Dude, outros, right? Like, Yo, and then that... even sometimes like. The background music in between, 
Mm-hmm. Cause that's really that's really what hits for me, bro. Like the sound and the music playing between dialogue. Like I remember even in Naruto, some of the the music that would play between some of the very sensual parts. Um, same with Cowboy Bebop. Like some of those classics, of course, Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo. But people don't really talk about Gogo 13, mm. which is like one of those animes that was like very obscure. It was about an assassin, basically. But the music from Gogo 13, intro, outro, it was really in the show that made you feel like, oh my gosh, this feels like you're in some type of like movie almost. Like it was nicely scored. It hit on the right moments and it was really nicely meshed with the right dialogue. Um, A lot of these random, smaller, noir animes give you really dope music, I feel Mm -hmm. like. Uh, one that really like took me, um, like for a loop for real before I was like searching on my own like from Toonami was Big O. Mm. I don't know. If, oh yeah, dog. Yeah, Big O man, Roger Smith, Dorothy, one of the, the best and overlooked to uh, one of the, one of the most uh, the greatest uh, and overlooked uh, mech animes. Oh my, oh, my gosh. gosh, and and it had all of the elements of storytelling you know what i mean Mm -hmm. it had had some like fearful horror spots and romance was there but then the action and comedy and it really gave you great story overall with a great backing soundtrack and every and i think it was it was this it was the fact that it was a score almost rather than just the same like because some anime will just be like okay we're just going to use the same songs and chop it up and be like, dun, 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 and just play it for transitional periods. Right, right. But but Big O gave you like, okay, I see why the emotion is rising and the sound is coming along with that. Mm. And it it is the it's the same sounds they were using in this one piece of a couple of episodes ago, but they didn't fully flesh that out. And now they're fleshing it out even further with, and they're adding strings to it. And, mm-hmm. and like, I felt the scoring of big O um, way more alongside that was Gundam dog, Gundam mm-hmm. wing. Oh, um, yeah. And mobile suit Gundam, was it mobile suit Gundam. I think it was Gundam, Gundam wing. And, the one where they're like kind of like post apocalyptic, but there were various um G Gundam. I'm G so Gundam. sorry. G oh, Gundam. Gotcha. Ah, I was like, I cannot say it. But G Gundam has some really dope music between <clears throat> scenes. Every time that there would be a fight scene almost, but then on the on the lull parts, on the subtleties, on the conversational parts. So like G Gundam, Gundam Wing, and Big O was like my first feeling of like okay dope scoring dragon ball z was like oh this is pretty cool like Mm -hmm. awesome transitional music you know what i'm saying of course Mm -hmm. rock music that gave you like amped you up for the actual content yeah but um i'll say recently music that has like really been crazy for me dude like uh bleach has some dope music in there man especially when they talk about like the young Ron cars and they bring in like salsa and, and like really wonderful Spanish Latin music because they are Spanish and Latin. I love that they do little additive details like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then lastly, I, the last one that I really was enjoying, um, I don't know if you've seen Neon Genesis Evangelion, but that is a wonderful, like I've sampled the soundtrack to that thing, mm. man. Um, but that's a wonderful very purposeful every song which still repeats itself every so often and gives you like that core memory of like oh this is the emotion i'm supposed to feel mm-hmm. it's kind of scoring it along beside you and understanding the story and it really brought in a different way of storytelling and it kind of captivated you in a in a completely different way than most traditional like it wasn't linear at all it was very uh, taking left turns, but then kind of circling back around and taking a completely different left turn. Mm-hmm. And that music kind of kept you steady a little bit, kind of kept your bearings when you're like figuring out 
the mystery of what's going on. Um, I didn't mention Yasuke. I apologize on that. Yasuke from Netflix with Flying Lotus. Him scoring Yasuke was so freaking dope because Flying Lotus, my idol, essentially my role model, I feel like him scoring Yasuke in such a br- like a brilliant, nuanced way. Like he said, he didn't want it to do Samurai Champloo or how RZA did Afro Sh- uh, Sa- Afro Samurai. Mm-hmm. He like took it onto his own and really like brought in, you know, Steven brought in himself within that whole thing. So I think Yasuke and Neon Genesis the past like 10 years have been like, really kicked it for me and then like when i was a kid it was like gundam and big o for real i i've been i've loved seeing hip-hop being like interweaved into uh anime over the years like a samurai shampoo is a is a really good example and yeah having the rizza being behind so many of these soundtracks and mm-hmm. yeah especially yeah of course Sam, afro samurai a big one Whew. such a powerful story dark and light and uh, I, I love the motifs. I, you know, I, I just, I love small things. Like I love that he likes lemonade still. He does. He, every time he goes to the bar, gets a, you know, this is the biggest, toughest dude's getting a, you know, a perspirating glass of lemonade with a straw coming out of it. It's like, that's, <laughs> that, I love that. Cause it is really, this. it's, it's what he finds solace in, you know, mm-hmm. in this dark world, there still is lemonade. Right. From all the lemons. Oh my gosh. That's a great detail to bring up. <laughs> Um, so since this is timely and, uh, we just recently lost, uh, Kora Toriyama and, mm-hmm. um, I, I noticed you were a fan of his cause you're wearing some Dragon Ball Z clothing. Do you have any, um, do you have any memories with the Kora Toriyama's work that really kind of inspired you or may have even inspired you musically? Man, definitely. Yeah. Rest in peace. Uh, blessings to friends and family that surround him and mm-hmm. that have encountered him um yeah man dragon ball z i feel like us as so i'm like 34 and that came around when i was my oldest's age so around like the time right now that he's actually getting to dragon ball z which is crazy because like literally they just started getting into dragon ball and then finished mm-hmm. that and getting into dragon ball z now like they're in the cell saga right now and Whoa. yeah like they're That's... binging the the hell out of it and it's everything that first first emotional connections to stuff right like yeah. super saiyan for the first time or even just learning he's a saiyan and what that really yeah. means and then being like oh he's not for real like everybody else and and so like seeing this outsider like really grow into himself yeah. and then i see that within my own oldest son like he in a way is just so different from everyone around him and he has like these different ways of thinking and i remember at a volleyball game one time he was just like doing different like power up moves mm-hmm. and he i was like what are you doing that for he's like i'm trying to help everyone else like get their thing going so they can get the the spike and get it over there and I, he's and basically spirit energy exactly yeah. dog like spirit, he was doing the spirit bomb before yeah. he even knew it dude That's so, so great seeing that and knowing like he really loves dragon ball z now and and knowing that this transformed me at that age and it's transforming my oldest son Mm -hmm. and it transformed all the kids that i was around that weren't super popular dude popular as in like easily invited to things easily capable of going through the normal experiences of like parties and relationships with different various amounts of people of various social classes Mm -hmm. and not having access to certain things and um, getting told no a lot and getting told uh, you're just not good enough. You're just not there. Just Mm -hmm. not having that, that opportunity. So having to figure out like where you fit in, what are you good at? What do you do? It's like, Oh, you're not, you're not too good at that, but you are good at this. But even if you are good at this is not good enough. And seeing anime in a way i didn't even think of it as anime for when i first sat down in my chair as a little kid and seeing like toonami and feeling like oh toonami what 
this is a new little thing. Like yeah. I remember like, you know, Team Nick and then like um uh Nick at night and just PBS even, but then like Toonami, this is something different. And and it felt like so comfortable seeing Dragon Ball Z start out and they gave us like little teasers. Toonami didn't like really say this is going to be a regular thing. They were like, we're going to premiere this thing. And you guys, we're not sure if it's going to be a thing, but we're going to just try it out. And I remember that first episode, like, this is amazing. And I was just sitting in the chair, like, like looking and just like mm-hmm. excited about it. And then it coming on and I wanted, I recorded it and I watched it over again, recorded on VHS, like mm-hmm. with my TV. Seeing this guy figure himself out and I remember watching episode after episode and then figuring my own self out as a as as a preteen to a teenager and practically growing into Dragon Ball Z even in high school and undergrad and allowing me to figure out like there's more to um the situation that's in front of me you know the whole idea of these lessons that are in anime a lot of the times, but digging deep, using friendship, understanding your environment. But then like the digging deep part has to come back. And then like, well, you dig deep, but you didn't get up there and it's, you're not, you're still not good enough. And mm-hmm. then going back to those same things that I was learning about and then seeing my son go through those things. And it's like, you're good right here, but then you're still struggling here. And then you're great here, but you're great here. And then it's just like all these things that don't immediately come to the forefront, but it's like super subtle. Anime really spiritually, religiously gives you that outlet of like, this can become, this can become better. I can, I can be better. I can do something more. I don't have to be in the same spot. I'm capable of, of loving something more, of loving people around me more, um, of being misunderstood and then still being accepted. Mm-hmm. So I think that Akira Toriyama giving us Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z and allowing us to see ourselves within not just Goku, but like Krillin and Master Roshi and Bulma and just. The idea of like you need to do more than like what's presented to you. You know what I mean? Like he lost in Dragon Ball, he lost his grandfather, and like he is just out there. Like he's not even thinking about Dragon Balls, but he's coming across people. They push him into something, mm-hmm. and that's how it goes. Like you get pulled in, like with this music thing. Like I got kind of pulled into something. I'm working with people, and like now I'm on a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So. It's like allowing yourself to like really live in the moment. I feel like Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z and GT and Super and all subgenres of it gave us that feeling of like acceptance of self and like rediscovery of self. So that's a great answer. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Thank you, bro. I appreciate that. So on to uh, a lighter topic. What do you think consciousness is? <laughs> Like in general, like in general, yeah. What is your what is your your theory on consciousness? Just, that's a heavy question. It's a dope question, though. Consciousness. Well, like, for there to be consciousness, there has to be like the opposite, which is um, you just doing the thing that you're supposed to do, which is just everything is naturally moving the way it's supposed to without Mm. us even figuring it out so it's like okay because of that happening what's the other thing that's happening Mm -hmm. so Mm. from what i've seen with all of like the knowledge that i've either read watched been told and knowing at the very root of everything that it's just a bunch of atoms moving super fast and because they're moving so fast and it somehow aligns with each other. And it's just like, okay, the right amount of things are where they need to be because everything is where it needs to be. 
right? Everything has a purpose, essentially. It's like, now, how do you make the stuff move? How do you make the things have the life? Mm-hmm. And um, really knowing that th- there's no, you can never grasp the consciousness. It's not something you are. It's something that is the movement between the atoms and all that. It's everything mm-hmm. between all of the things that are just here. So I think that personally, when I think of consciousness, it's how am I moving through the things that are already existing? And what does that really, not really mean? Because you can't really make a meaning out of it. It's like, what is it? We we want to make the meaning out of it, mm-hmm. which is our thinking of consciousness and how we relate to what's already here. And so that in between spot of like where we know we are and where we think we are, because mm-hmm. we know we're somewhere, but we're it's not it. Like we like you had said in the beginning, it's like things are constantly changing even without us even thinking about it. You think you know everything right here 24 hours later, one second or whatever time allows us to see from one thing to the next thing, you can call it a moment. You can call Mm -hmm. it like a time construct. That thing that just moved is consciousness, Mm -hmm. right? Just keep it super simple. Yeah, the thing that moved is consciousness between what's already existing. I love that. Uh, I'm always fascinated by consciousness and what what it could be and i think it might my personal theory is uh it might be kind of like an emergent product of of life mm. uh almost like a, uh gravity is almost uh, maybe in a time might be a emergent product of space and mass and maybe perhaps, mm. and, and maybe consciousness is somewhere interweaved within that relationship through all mm. things. Um, well articulated. <laughs> thank you. I like that more. <laughs> uh, where does the name Simile come from? I have to ask. <laughs> I, I, I've, yeah, I of just, course, yeah, I have my guesses, but please. Definitely. Pray tell. That's awesome. Yeah, Simile. Well, the moniker, dog, like, that was, um, that came so much later i've had so many other monikers before that aliases or whatever like Mm -hmm. identities that i've been like and it's not even like i need something to tell people a separation of myself for the thing it it's always been how can i relate back to this thing and hip-hop in general is always a you need some type of feeling to know that you're a part of it. So, mm-hmm. like, the feeling could be, like, you got your own sound. Right. You, or, like, you got your own swag. Like, you look different than everybody else. Mm. Or, like, you come from a certain part of town, huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Only those folks sound like that. Mm. Or when music mm. was like, oh, you're from the South. Yeah. All music from yeah. the South is crazy. Yeah. Like, that's different from Midwest or from the North or whatever. So it's like, mm-hmm. when you're a part of hip-hop, you're like, I want to be a part of the thing, so I have to have something with it. So it's like, the swag came through, and I started figuring out, like, okay, this is how I need to wear certain things. And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of MTV raps was influencing me on how to make music in a large way too so i knew i had to be like fourth i had to be like in the forefront of things so i had to be Mm. powerful for things so i would be like i need to have something like a powerful name right something that's crazy and i went through like so many i'm not even gonna say them but like so many different like random names and i remember in undergrad at one time i was just like everyone as i was making music I slowly was thinking like, this is just going to help me write more because I was also writing. I was studying poetry a lot more. And my biggest connection was lyricism. So Mm -hmm. as much as I was like, oh, the sample from Kick Push from Lupe, I was still just all about his lyrics at that point. I wanted to be an MC before anything. 
So I was thinking like, I need an MC name, right? No idea like I should use this for some platform or I need to present right. myself. But I just was like, naturally, you if you're an MC, you have an MC style name mm. and knowing like, oh, that's why... Um, that's when I was starting to learn more about like, okay, that's why Jay Z is Jay Z, or like that's why mm. um, Nas was like, so Nas Nazir. Okay, so there's sometimes nicknames, mm. there's sometimes shortening of things. Sometimes they mm. use their middle name. Okay, so I'm figuring out origins. Yeah, completely different monikers. Like uh, you got Mac Miller and Larry Fisherman. <sighs> exactly, that's same the, person, but. But Larry Fisherman's the producer. Mm-hmm. Where exactly. Mac Miller's the rapper. Yeah. What are you doing with this as well? So as I was like lyrically trying to figure out like what do I want to go by, I would present myself to other people and they would say like, oh, you sound like so-and-so or like mm-hmm. you sound like this. Mm-hmm. Um, when I would rap or when I, not even think it was rapping, but I would be more spoken word and it's like, oh, you, you make me feel like this or sound like this. Mm. Like, man, I'm always getting compared to something else, or I'm always being told, like, yeah, you are like this thing, but never truly myself. So, simile, as I was a writer and I was learning more and more about poetry and creative writing, I would always use similes in my poetry mm-hmm. more than metaphors. And so, my teachers would always be like, Oh, you got a good simile in that one, that's a mm-hmm. good stanza right here, good simile on this one. So I would say, like, the writing part, figuring out how to be a part of hip-hop, gave me, like, oh, I want to be simile. And in undergrad, I was still going by Knuckles the Fly Guy. That okay. was That was one that I was going by heavily. And then my grandfather called me Knucklehead growing up. So I would always be like, well, I'm the fly guy. I would yeah. always have the flyest stuff on. Yeah. I'd be, like, ahead of the game with fashion. So when it came to... Knuckles the fly guy, I was like, it just doesn't sit right. And I was just like, well, I'll just do another one, like Mac Miller, Larry Fisher. I'll just have another moniker. Mm -hmm. So I was like, Knuckles the fly guy and simile. Mm -hmm. And then I remember one of my, uh, one of the cats that I knew in undergrad, um, he had told me, you should do lay at the end. You should do simile. Mm -hmm. Shout out Reggie McDaniel, man. Reggie and then Roger, we were in the dorm rooms. And I would be like, simile, simile, and I would be writing my stuff down and like, and then a simile, and then a dinner. And it's like, change it to simile. Mm. You know, add a little bit of a difference yeah, there. Yeah, a little spice. A little spice there. Mm. And I was like, okay, this sounds crazy. Yeah. And I remember walking from the dorm, from his dorm room and stuff, going back to mine, I'm like, simile, I like that. Yeah. And then I was like, but I don't like that. But mm. then I was like, I like that. And, and then I just kept fighting with it. And then mm. I'm thinking like, I definitely just wanted to be like that because Mm -hmm. so my full name is Nathaniel and L E I would always have to say like N A T H A N I E L. And I would always say it in that way, whether it was on the phone or Mm. in person and the I E L would always be emphasized. And so I just was like Mm. E L and I put the lay and then I went back to simile and I put the accent there too. And it kind of connected from, Hearing him say it, and then years later, not using Knuckles the Fly Guy anymore, and mm-hmm. just going by Simile, mm. and that came from writing a whole bunch and wanting to be a part of hip hop. Right. And Simile was the only thing for the longest time, and then it became Simile the Sound Enthusiast because mm-hmm. I once again went back. To, I started finally calling myself a musician. What within the past, I feel like six years maybe mm-hmm. not too long bro because i still was trying to think of myself as like i just want to get better at engineering i just want to do this or like i'm not that good or i'm not at this level of like i'm practicing rudiments or i'm practicing my skills or something like that like i didn't see myself as practicing so much so i was like even though i'm simile the musician I'm still just the sound enthusiast. I mm. still just love sounds. Like I'm not trying to be a musician. And I'm, even right now, like I'm not trying to be an, a designer. Um, I'm not trying to be an engineer or any of that anymore. 
it's really just, I am just so enthusiastic about sound of all shapes and sizes, all colors and creeds that Simile the sound enthusiast became what I really like. I, it's like I found myself. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, I am, a, I am like everything else. And that's cool because I can take everything and make it my own. Mm-hmm. And it's all sounds. And mm-hmm. the difference between all of us, myself and all of us, is I'm enthusiastic about it way more than I than you can probably be about it than I can. So yeah. I want to show you how much I love sound mm-hmm. to the hundredth, to the ninth degree. Yeah. yeah. I love that. That's a that's a great origin. <laughs> yeah. You, I, I love that name. And it 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 has meaning behind it and it is a it it does sound good off the tongue. It just feels good. Just <laughs> simile. It, 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 I love that name. Thank you, bro. <laughs> so before we uh, leave here today, I wanted to uh, share a quote with you that was really meaningful to me that um, I found in a uh, an old record that I had. It was on the back of it from the audio engineer. Uh, his name is uh, Eric Blackstead, and he mm. was the... He was the guy put in charge of the of putting together all of the audio from Woodstock in 1969 <laughs> and making the soundtrack, oh. and it ha- I mean it was a job that was so unprecedented like no one no one had ever done anything like this before like and uh, so I have the record here with me. Oh, that's so cool. And on the back here, I just I I will never. Yeah, this is so powerful to me. I, I love this um, this quote. Uh, it goes like this. The recording of the music at Woodstock was a challenge of unprecedented scope and complexity, requiring a level of endurance from both man and machine previously unheard of in location recording. The music and sounds in this album were selected from 64 reels of 8-track tape recorded over a period of three and a half days in three continuous 18-hour sessions. Technical flaws resulting from equipment failure as well as human overload are inevitable in a venture of this size. Just as in an inevitability, some of them occur in the material included in this album. Consider them like scars and fine leather, proof of the origin and authenticity of the material in which they are found. <laughs> Smooth. <laughs> he did it. And I think that's just something that is just, that is so, it rings so true. Uh, there's, there's a genuineness in that vinyl crackle of the sample. You know, you, you want, you don't want it to be too clean. You know, mm-hmm. there's something that's so human. Like when we talked about auto tuner, don't put that response time to zero. You want put a little, hu- hu- there's a, in, in Antares, they have a humanized button. Mm. And, uh, uh, and we're always <laughs> trying to chase over that, that humanity when we go further and further into uh, technological perfection. You know, when we quantize drums, mm. when perfectly quantized drums, they don't sound just right. Mm. But when you start moving them, to be imperfect, like certain imperfect, it so- starts to sound more real and more human, better. Mm-hmm. And so there's a there's a balance between humanity and and technological perfection or quantization, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that I think we'll always be riding that fine line of, especially with AI coming. But I think what will always ring true is that quote there is that there is you. You consider them like scars on fine leather, proof of mm. their authenticity. And it's what makes it real. It's what helps it resonate with you. It's mm. what brings it to life. That's so true. Similarly, thank you so much for being uh, here with me today and taking the time. Uh, thank you so much. Of that course. last quote was amazing, by the way. Thank you. I loved every bit of it. <laughs> Terms and conditions is out everywhere music is sold. Sounds like underscore lay on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your Patreon is sounds like simile. Yes, yes. Is there anybody you'd like to shout out or anything else you'd like to Man, plug for yourself? Thank you for inviting me. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, Terms and conditions is out. Got a lot of great joints on there, man, mm-hmm. from beginning to end. More music on the way, too. More like, you guys are going to be ecstatic. You know, I've been working with 
quite a few cats. Shout out to Cabal, man. Mm. Uh, Alan Vice. Oh, yeah. Um, SB Austin, Just Bars, my guys. And mm. as I said, all the producers here, like just really trying to hone in. And as much as we're releasing on Bandcamp, shout out Bandcamp. Shout mm. out everyone actually finding ways to use it and going in there and yeah. and making it easier for us to release music on there, not just on streaming. So I just want to say, like, thank you for pressing play. Thank you for listening. Thank you for allowing me to just be an artist and just be myself. And and I think that's a lot of um, dialogue and conversation, too, or just allowing the audience members and people on the Internet, allowing us to just be ourselves and then folks like yourself allowing us to be ourselves for other people to see that, you right. know, in a larger sense. So this is a blessing, honestly, and mm. it is very serious to a very large degree, the representation that you're giving. So I really wanted to just hone in on that and say thank you for being a, a very wonderful voice, um, unbiased, positive, articulate, beautifully crafted, well-written understandable and thank you for highlighting things and not bringing um any weirdness to mm. it right i just want to put it all out there dog just saying I like appreciate really that. appreciate you dog yeah. i feel <laughs> i could say the same for you you bring genuineness and real humanity and great uh energy everywhere you go and so i i appreciate that a lot and so that's that's why i definitely you're the first person that came to mind Thank you, man. Oh, thank you for, <laughs> for taking the time to talk with me today. <laughs> Keep streaming the music, too, yes. guys. <laughs> thank you, bro. Of course. I appreciate you. Till next time, man. Till next time, man. <laughs>